So welcome everyone. It's a special privilege uh, to have today because uh, we have already uh, got uh, reviews of the state of the world in terms of epistemological frameworks, which means that uh, those who were speaking at least uh, pretend that they, they know the proof, the evidence. And now we turn into another plane, a more metaphysical plane, that perhaps truth is not uh, something which can be checked by empirical means, but by heart. And I think it's more important than the epistemological tools. But before going to the problems, uh, let me introduce or, uh, just a few words of the panel participants. Unfortunately, it's Shomo Kuresh, the right, one of the branches of the Hungarian Jewish uh, Nation, uh, was unable to come because he was invited to report to the Prime Minister. So you have to be content with the participants who are really excellent and you will see. On my left is sitting uh, Victoria uh, Edith-Dea, who is uh, Prior's General of the Dominican Sisters of the Congregation of St. Margaret of Hungary. And uh, she read history and classical theology at uh, the Florida University, University. And uh, she did her PhD at the same university. And the stop, uh, topic was medieval uh, hagiography, the study of saints. And the outcome of this dissertation has been published in Hungarian several years ago. In Hungarian in French as well. On my right is sitting with a young uh, student who is uh, more mature than he does look, Muhammad uh, <laughs> Bacinovic, who was born, uh, unbelievable, in 1996 in Munich, of two Bosnian refugees. And he was raised in Salzburg in, in Vienna. Currently, he is a student of political science and editor of an online magazine, which uh, conducts interviews with figures in politics, culture, society, and business. And he is supposed to, to, uh, to talk about uh, the relationship of the Muslim uh, religion with other uh, religions, and generally represent the Muslim uh, view. And the right of him is sitting uh, Professor Renard Stoff, uh, who is Professor of Philosophy and Head of the Institute for the Philosophical Studies the Science and Research Center of Koper, and Professor of Humanities at Alma Mater LNK in Maribor. He is also visiting Professor of Religion and Faculty of Theology at the University of Ljubljana. So you see that he has extended uh, tasks uh, on the field of uh, religion and theology. And we are top. I'm an associate professor of culture and anthropology at the same university that I used to be, and a good friend of mine. And you will see that he has a quite extended knowledge, everything which is connected to the culture and anthropology of religion. And in a way, he, I asked him to, to replace, of course, cannot be replaced, but try to replace the empty place of uh, uh, Shlomo Kuresh, because he knows about a lot of uh, the Jewish religion, and uh, we had uh, quite a good, uh, interesting research in one of the communities of the Jewish uh, religion in Budapest. And finally, he's at the least to introduce his eminence, uh, Andrei Tsirevich, uh, the bishop of the Serbian Orthodox Epochy, Bosnia, in Sicily. And uh, he's bishop uh, of his uh, countries, and uh, since uh, 2017, he has functioned as administrator of the diocese of Frankfurt in Germany. So he, he has quite extended functions all over Europe. And uh, I will ask him to give us some uh, account of the uh, Christian, and this is the Christian, the Orthodox uh, version of the Christian religion, how they, how they do look at the changing situation in the world. And to start uh, the problems, I thought that uh, when I was thinking about how to introduce, probably you remember several years ago, James Carvey, who was one of the campaign uh, managers of the Clinton uh, campaign, and he had the slogan that uh, it's economy, stupid. And actually this was a very useful slogan, and they won the elections. I think that if we, uh, uh, if we are thinking about a good slogan, for a new kind of elections, then what we have to carve on the table, it is, uh, it is identity, the stupid. Because I think that identity has become the most important issue in the whole world, because as we have heard in the previous uh, panels, 
and there were many of them last week, and all of them were very exciting. But uh, probably you share my experience that uh, the result of these panels was uncertainty, increasing uncertainty. So people were talking about uncertainty, and as they had uh, spoken about uncertainty, we became more and more anxious. So finally, we just uh, left the rooms every day trembling. Because we really don't know what will happen. Uh, we, do, we don't know what will happen in nature, perhaps catastrophes, floods, chaos, uh, war, and, but we don't know what will happen in society. And this confluence of two kinds of uncertainties in science, in, in, na in nature, in society, has resulted in the kind of confusion in ourselves. And uh, the reason I think that we are very fortunate now, because in a way you are, or at least uh, I, I'm not, uh, not uh, mistaken, you are at least uh, uh, professionals of uncertainty. So you offer certainty in this world, where we are living in, in, complex, uh, in, in, uh, in constant fear and, and anxiety. And I do really think, and this is my question first, that uh, the sociological theories concerning secularization, uh, in a way, are uh, went astray. Because sociologists, including Max Weber uh, and, and other following him, so that modernity is a, is a new kind of society, it will, it will create a, a brave new uh, world, where of course religion will remain, will remain as a private matter. It will be up to the decision of the individual to believe or not to believe, but otherwise, otherwise in the everyday life, modernity will provide them with all necessary means of survival. And third out, as we have proceeded in modernity, past modernity and we arrive post-modernity, and who knows, who knows who will be next, uh, this kind of security, this kind of promise of comfort, this kind of promise of, uh, promise of uh, happiness, completely disappeared and turned into a nightmare. It's therefore, I do, say, I do think that the secularization crisis should be reversed, and probably is reversed already in life. And how do you see that this problem, that uh, is it, am I wrong when I suppose that, uh, that this is a day what we are facing, uh, the secularization, the, the old secularization cases will just go away and instead there will be an emergence of religion, an emergence of searching of religious values and the God whom, uh, whom uh, Nietzsche uh, in the 19th century declared to be dead, the God will resurrect or never have death, never die. So what's your opinion concerning this Withering away of the secularization pieces. This is going to be my first question. And uh, I think that uh, we can choose the order. Perhaps, Sister, we can be the first. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? With it? <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, one more thing I, I would add to my uh, comments. Uh, I think that uh, I am not just a professional of certainty as a religious sister, as a Dominican, but I am teaching theology, so I am interested um, <coughs> of this question not only as a believer, but also as a, as a professor of theology. And um, the first thing I would add that uh, I completely agree with this uh, diagnosis, uh, what uh, Professor Kennedy, um has said before. Uh, and I agree that uh, this, um, I would say, naive theory of uh, secularization has to be remodeled. That uh, which, what you said that um, this theory says that uh, secularization is like evolution. It's a natural process uh, which goes uh, hand in hand with modernity and uh, which uh, leads to the it's a complete disappearance of religion and uh, religious faith. And in recent decades, there were uh, several uh, scholars who uh, put question marks uh, about this thesis. For example, um, Charles Taylor, I think uh, he, he is one of the most important figures in this discussion, who is a Catholic, uh, Canadian um, philosopher, or social scientist, I mean. Most. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and, um, and the other one is um, Jose Casanova, who um, formulated the, the theory that secularization, as we know it, it's uh, especially 
European phenomenon and uh, we need a broader perspective and for example if you see the example of the United States it's very interesting that uh, modernity goes uh, hand in hand with a very strong uh, religious affiliation and just this morning I searched for a, um, a study of the Pew Research Forum for sociological research and, and it's very interesting what said that in the US um, there was a um, recent research which said that 80% of all um, people in the United States said that they have a faith in God or a supernatural power. So it's very interesting, I think, because it's a very different uh, picture from, uh, from Europe, I think. So I think that this is very true. And I think that uh, in Europe we have uh, special factors for this um, return of, I, I, would, I would call it a return of the sacred, what, what happens now. Uh, now. Uh, and um, it has several forms, I think uh, in Europe and here in Central Eastern Europe there are special factors for, for this phenomenon. Uh, one, what you, you mentioned uh, already, I would call it postmodernity or a kind of um, relativism. Uh, a kind of rationality uh, without truth or uh, liquid modernity, what Sigmund Bergman says. Um, and um, also, together with this phenomenon, there is a, there is a, a return of, of a quest for, a, for certainties, for a stronger identity, and we see many, um, um, many signs of this uh, resurgence or um, return of religion and return of the sacred, but I, I would say that it doesn't mean that this is a return of the institutional religion in many cases. So I, I think that we can see this, that uh, there is a very sharp uh, difference, between, or not, maybe not very sharp, but there is a, a strong difference between personal faith and religion and um, a return for a quest for the spiritual or for the sacred, which has, has many very interesting um, Science uh, also here in Hungary, uh, um, a quest for tradition, for every kind of tradition, religious traditions and historical traditions and national um, traditions, and, and this is connected, of course, uh, with personal religion, but nothing in other case. Thank you. You raised uh, already very important questions, and we shall return to these questions. But now I pass it over to you. How do you see this uh, problem of uh, secularization and, uh, and religious revival? Uh, it depends. I think Europe is here divided. If I look at Eastern Europe, um, the, the, the belief is a little bit stronger than in Middle Europe. Where do you see the border <coughs> between Eastern Europe and the rest of Europe? Um, I think I would say um, it starts at Hungary and, and, and uh, goes um, straight to Russia and forward. Yeah, so on the borders to Russia. Uh, um, and I think it has to do with econ economical growth. Um, and, and when you see every, every country which grows economically, um, the, the, the belief in faith is uh, sinking. When, I, when I, uh, my, my, my parents were, um, were uh, had flewed from, from Bosnia to, to Germany, um, before the war they, are, they are, were communists. But after the war or in the time of uncertainty, become um, believers. So in times of uncertainty, yeah, it's true that we are searching easy answers or a uh, superpower um, uh, beyond us. But um, I think it, it secularization will will not stop. I think it's becoming uh, it's becoming it has challenges, but it will not stop right now. At least not in Western Europe. Yeah. Hmm. But later we shall go about the European problems. So it, it was a very straightforward uh, uh, statement. Uh, Professor Kreff, how do you see this problem? I will talk uh, from my uh, philosophical position. I mostly studied philosophy. What I'm doing now is kind of philosophical theology, and I'm interested in political theology as well, ethics. Uh, in my uh, point of departure is uh, methodologically or epistemologically American pragmatism. Now if we discuss the secularization, uh, this is of course obviously 
Enlightenment European kind of thinking. Uh, but if we go to the United States, for example, if we think with uh, John Dewey or later Roberto Unger, which is my philosophical hero, apart from some other European philosophers and theologians, <coughs> then we should replace this talk about secularization with talk about community. Now, <coughs> my latest works, I'm somehow developing this radicalized idea of spiritual community, where spiritual or the, the, the word spiritual does not refer anymore to any metaphysical or similar um, kind of thinking, but is more materialistic uh, word, which somehow, you know, etymologically spiritus means bread to breathe, to be together in, in one uh, common breath. So it is very close what uh, one of the founders of our infant pregnancy, Josiah Royce, wanted to say with uh, loving or beloved community, which is united by the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, after Nietzsche or after William James, United States, uh, in the 20th century, it's not possible to talk that the Holy Spirit should unite us, at least in the public sphere. If you talk with uh, my uh, uh, teacher, Richard Rorty, I worked with him in the United States, or even with John Rawls, they would obviously say that religion is a conversation stopper or something like that. And Charles Taylor would object that it is not so. And I agree with Charles Taylor that religion could not be dismissed from the public sphere you know, with one move. Also, Rorty, in, towards the end of his life, like he somehow changed his view and he did not uh, uh, defend the so-called atheistic stance, but he was only anti-clericalistic, which is smart, I think. And he said that somewhere in the future, and this would be the, the, the meaning of this spiritual community, which I can explain later, uh, that somewhere in the future, there will be a civilization where the love will be the only law. So this is, again, it is a Christian, it is maybe Catholic, it is Protestant, it is Orthodox, it is Jewish idea, Messianic idea, it is idea of all ideas of all religions, but it has nothing to do with secularization, neither with radical laicite uh, theories from France or even from Slovenia. For example, in Slovenia we have a very divided society. On one side we have this post-Marxist laicite tradition. On the other side we have an extremely conservative Catholic Church, which is probably among the most, most conservative churches with Poland or Croatia compared even on the same scale. So in between there is a vacuum, I think, also in the public sphere there is no you know, bridge, there is no useful discussion, so I do not like to discuss these things in my own country because I do not understood me, be understood. But what I would like to say that neither secularization nor, of course, any kind of new conservatism, but we need to talk about community, about political theology, about how we form communities. What is community? Community means that we are extending, simply extending our circles of of sympathies. Maybe for Rorty, the ideal limit would be Francis of Assisi or Buddha. They were even able to extend their sympathies towards animals. Maybe we can extend sympathies a bit more and include an asylum seeker or a migrant. I don't know, you know. I, I would like to, to do it in hospitality. It's very important in my thinking. Maybe we can extend uh, nature in a way, because you mentioned nature. So this would be my field of, of discussion today. Yeah, I like very much this approach, which uh, is quite inclusive. It includes the, uh, everything in the name of spirituality. And also, it was a very important observation of you. The spirituality is not just uh, something that belongs to metaphysical uh, yes. supposed reality, but it's, it's incarnated, a, uh, it's incarnated yes. uh, reality. So in our, in our and community. Closely connected to community. Perhaps we shall return to this concept of community. But before, uh, let me uh, give the word to Pierre Pop. Thank you. So, as you see, this question is very complex. So, uh, every details of this question is very, very interesting. And as you see, we won't find any answers, I guess, but we can ask more questions about this really, really very complex problem. So, about the secularization, it's very interesting. Uh, Paul Hillers, uh, a sociologist, a uh, sociologist of religion uh, wrote a very interesting essay about the challenging secularization theory. 
which is in front of me. Uh, I didn't know that you will ask this question, but um, when I was thinking about this panel, uh, one of the first uh, essays, or studies about this uh, came to my mind. Because he had a project uh, some years ago, he called this project uh, uh, as Kendall Project. He went, Kendall is a small city in Britain, and uh, the critical theory about the secularization is that uh, especially after the 70s, we can talk in Europe or in the US about a new phenomenon uh, which is called like a spiritual revolution or spiritual revival in the Western cultures. Which means that uh, it's true, not the institutionalized, not the traditional uh, churches, but the other forms of spirituality are increasing. Especially from the 50s, 60s and, and the 70s in the West. So, uh, he was, uh, made a field work about this question in a small city in Britain. And what he found, it's very interesting, he found that in, <coughs> in 70, uh, in, the, in every uh, document, even, uh, even the yellow pages, he conducted every detail, he absolutely didn't find any details about any non-church uh, spiritual movements or offices or practices in this small uh, British uh, town. But after 30 years, he found 126 separate activities provided by 95 spiritual practitioners. So it was a boom. Only in uh, 30 years, this type of uh, activity of spiritualism completely changed. And it happened in Glastonbury and other spiritual uh, places. So he was continuing his research uh, in a more bigger uh, context. And what he found today in Britain, everywhere in England, uh, the people in one week, a weekly, who is uh, practicing yoga, they are around uh, 400,000 uh, people, which is more, much more than, much more number than the participants, weekly participants of the Methodists or other Protestant churches. Which means there is this, uh, this, this uh, theory about the secularization have to uh, discuss. Because we cannot, uh, when we are talking about and thinking about spirituality, we really don't uh, have to think only about the churches, the traditional uh, uh, religions. We have to focus on the new forms of sp uh, spirituality. And the number of the practitioners of this type of spirituality is growing and growing. So it's very interesting that the, uh, it's a postmodern situation, according to Dury. So, uh, as the social scientist is, scientist is talking about the postmodernity, they are all the time emphasizes that, uh, especially in the 20th century, the grand narratives, the big questions, the big concepts, and the big rules, and the big philosophies and theologies and the religions are not died, but somehow changed. People. Most of the people don't believe anymore in grand narratives. They are focusing on the individual questions. So the individuality and postmodernism are together. They are connecting to each other. And for the form, spiritual form of individualism is the new form of spirituality. Because you can participate in yoga, and at the same time, you, your identity can be a Catholic or a Jewish. I am practicing yoga with uh, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. And we are all the time identifying and joking each other that, oh, you are Jew, you are a Catholic. So the, this type of identity marks, which we belong to, to our churches, or origins are important for us as an identity mark. But we are practicing yoga at the same time. 
So we can practice yoga, we can go to uh, uh, some alternative uh, uh, healers, we can go to Thai massage, we can do Reiki, we can do any other things at the same time. This is the form of the new spirituality of postmodernism, which is fluid, which is flexible, which is changeable as for life, because uncertainty is our life experience. And if we see the life as an investment, we have to decide what we would like to decide. To work for the heaven, uh, being a part of a collectivist group, and uh, following the rules, and cutting our ego, or choose another way, choose another way, be as the modern mythology tells to us, try to make ourselves. Try, try to be who we are. And this type of spirituality can help us to be who are we. This is a very important narrative message of the new forms of spirituality. So, to sum up, we may, it's a question. Can we, can we talk about secularism? Or maybe it's better to talk about another form of spiritualism in the today's work. Thank you. You remain faithful to yourself and radicalize the discussion. <laughs> and I hope that uh, uh, further uh, responses will follow. But before going into um, the continuation of the discussion, I would like to have your uh, view uh, concerning the first question, because uh, in a way you are closely linked to an organized church, an institution, and you are faced with the challenges which were formulated by the members of the panel. Thank you, moderator. I would like to say that I enjoyed very much this introduction panel, and uh, I would like to follow up with the conviction that we all, at least normal people, know that our future world will be characterized by pluralism. So we see now uh, how the world functions, and before us is uh, the need of mutual responsibility and accountability. This is a thing which is also uh, common with the fact that we live in a time where the dialogue has become the symbol of our times. And this also the churches and the religions can understand more and more. And thanks to God, also science has helped to review uh, knowledge about other religions. For example, we as Orthodox Christians or Catholic Christians or Protestant Christians can review a little our point of views towards Islam, towards Judaism, because uh, science does its tasks and helps this dialogue and this mutual responsibility. This was also viewed by political parties. And you know, 30 years ago, <coughs> the democratic parties in the European <coughs> Union, they started bilateral dialogues with the religions and inter alia also a bilateral dialogue with the Orthodox Church, seeing that the Orthodox Church is a very uh, uh, recognized church and plays a big role in the societies. In some, in some uh, countries, the Orthodox Church is a majority church, but in many, many countries, the Orthodox Church is a minority church. And political leaders were interested how the Orthodoxy is dealing with the event. So, in the European Union, the uh, United European, uh, the U European People Parties, Democratic Parties, started this dialogue, and this helped also us, the churches, very much. Wherever the Orthodox churches are located, they search to be recognized as a corporation of uh, public recognition to um, make in order the state-church relationships. And earlier or later, we understood that secularism is standing also before our doors, knocking at our doors. And we are happy now as Orthodox churches in the diaspora, as myself, for example, in Switzerland and Austria, to face with the phenomenon of secularization, knowing that earlier or later it will also reach in the 
Eastern European regions. So this is very important. And uh, this is why I uh, congratulate this occasion that we have today to discuss about this phenomenon and to see how we can bring forward on a panel of interreligious understanding and communication this important topic. Thank you, but um, don't be misled, I will take you into the jungle. <laughs> because um, I, I like very much, and I was pleased by the general tone of the interventions. This tone can be characterized as tolerance, empathy, love, community. But uh, you were not present in the previous panels in the last week. And uh, based on those interventions, we uh, could have, uh, have the conclusion that the world is, 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 is less tolerant, less peaceful, uh, less uh, friendly uh, than you have characterized. And uh, we had uh, lectures about uh, the rise of populism, the surge of fundamentalism, uh, the conflict between uh, uh, irreconcilable value systems. So it seems to me that uh, while we are uh, living here in the ivory tower of love, <coughs> on the, our feet, uh, there is a turbulent reality, and this turbulent reality can be characterized, uh, like in the past, by conflicts uh, on the plane of values, not just on the plane of economy. And the nature of value conflict is such that uh, there is no truth, only the stronger will be. And I would like to have your opinion that how religions uh, in institutional forms or less institutional forms as, as spiritual uh, inclinations can contribute to solve this contradiction between the turbulent reality and our striving, our wish, desire to have, uh, to have uh, spiritual peace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's not easy question, but we don't know the answer. They perhaps we have the answer, but I just wanted to fuel your mind. Yes, please. Uh, we have raised this theme in the topic of violence. That violence is a phenomenon which is located in every human nature, in every human being. And the question is that we religious people, we should reject violence, however, as a mean of communication. Uh, violence uh, means that uh, religious also often unwillingly can be caught into conflicts and rather become tools of problematics than to become a help of orientation. So all this question about how religions face with these uh, challenges of our modern world has to do with our readiness to, uh, to know that our cooperation and our communication will help that interreligious dialogue before the state, before the society, and before the uniting world which we are, will help to give to the people an orientation rather than a confusion while we are so divided between us. And this is a phenomenon and uh, we can be happy that this is a thing of the social doctrine, doctrine and has to do with spirituality. People who live spiritual, they are not free from uh, doing violence if they are not controlled by their true spiritual life and uh, moved and touched by the true love of God. So there is a question and it's very good um, opening of the discussion. What is your opinion when, when uh, religion is used by political powers, like in Russia for instance, that Putin probably couldn't work so well without the support of the Orthodox Church? Yes, we, we observe this while the the uh, medias, the mass medias, which are talking about that, and other Orthodox churches are worried about that. As you know, we have uh, many Orthodox churches, the Ecumenical Patriarch in Constantinople, or the Patriarch of Jerusalem, or the Patriarchate of uh, Romania, or Bulgaria, Serbia, Poland, Cyprus, Czechoslovakia. And if we understand that there is a misuse of religion or of the church by the political leaders, we have to act. Myself, I try to understand the, the way of the rehabilitation of the Russian people. After all the century of war and of ideological uh, uh, civil confrontation, I think that things are not so easy. I would like to uh, accept the critics 
in the public opinion about what happens between the Russian Orthodox Church and the political leadership there. But I would uh, think that this is a theme which needs a very long uh, um, uh, reflection. Yeah, it's no question that there are open wounds, and maybe that these wounds can be healed by the, uh, by the help of the church. So, um, how about uh, continuing? Uh, it's an interesting, interesting question uh, you raised. Um, when we look back at history, um, I think there were really rare uh, times of peace between religions, or among religions. Um, really rare times. And people in power always have used um, a religion for power purposes. So, uh, and it will, uh, it will be like this in future also. Um, I think it's not, um, 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 it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to answer the whole question, but it would be a step forward if we acknowledge other religions. When I look at, at, at the Muslim world and how we speak about them in Middle Europe, it's like they're barbarics uh, um, um, there in the southern of the world. So um, a little more acknowledge uh, and a little more respect to other uh, faiths, I think it would be uh, not just only to register them as uh, something, but a little more showing respect to each other would be a huge step forward. It's not happening right now. We're down looking on them like, oh, you you. Maybe you wear some, uh, you wear something about 500 years ago, but today, <coughs> look at you, how how shameful you are. Um, and uh, what's your opinion about uh, Erdogan and his uh, efforts to, uh, how to say, reconstruct uh, the Muslim religion in the old imperialist way? Yeah, for power purposes. I think he would be like to be uh, again a sultan uh, like five, 500 years ago. But it's uh, it's uh, more difficult. But I understand of the point of how he how his so socialization, um, why he's trying to enforce um, religion back into the Turkey, because um, in the times where Erdogan was raised um, uh, and, and grew up, um, there was the religion were oppressed. If you if you talked about a, a, a so-called Islam democracy, you were thrown up in jail. So um, um, Erdogan is one who, 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 who knew how it is um, um, to, to, be, to be oppressed when, when you're... I see, but now you are strong in prison if you talk about democracy. True, true. Yeah, that, that's how, how power in Turkey works. <laughs> they, they, they were, yeah, it's true. Look, um, 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 uh, it's not, not just only today. Um, um, uh, it's the situation in Turkey is how it is. Um, when you look at uh, throughout history of the Tur of Turkey, they always threw people up in jail if 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 um, if they if they're too yeah okay, to, to asking many questions. Not use the word always, please. <laughs> this yeah, is a dangerous word. word because the most of the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, it is a complex question again. So I, I mean. Every question. Is Every question. So, from a sociological and cultural perspective, I agree with you. I mean, power and religion cannot be together. If a church, any of them, uh, Christians or Muslims or, but this, yeah, Jew Jewish uh, congregation, some. Uh, somehow support the power, any any political power that is, it will maintain the conflict. So uh, the first step could be to stop with the, the, and not only in Russia or in Turkey, it happens in Hungary. So, uh, and in Poland, a lot of Eastern European countries, you can observe this. If it doesn't stop, won't be peace, I'm sure. Um, and that is another problem, I guess. This is the sociological problem. But the other problem is, as I know, I'm not a big expert of theology as you, but as I see this, uh, in Christianity, in Islam, uh, the concept, the anthropological concept of these religions are um, somehow based on these uh, making borders and differences between the people. So our community is 
the true religion, yeah. our faith is the true faith, our spirituality is the true spirituality, and others are semi-true or non-true. They, they are okay sometimes, or absolutely not okay, but maybe okay, but they, know, they don't know, they don't follow the real reality, the real truth. So the concept, the theological concept of these religions is there is a God, and I got my life, my spirit from God. I have, to, I have to live under the rules of God. I have to follow his rules because I got my life, I got my spirit <coughs> from him. And when this life in the, in the earth will finish, my spirit will come back to God. And I will be judged by my behaviors, by my acts, what I did in my life, what I uh, did, how I I, I, I lived with this gift, the life and spirit from God. So I have to follow the rules. So there is somebody outside. I got my life and my, my life rules, my, my acting of life from him. So it's something, everything is from outside. And this is the origin of other secular uh, religions as nationalism as well. So we have a leader, we have our nation, we have something. We got something, we got our life, and we are responsible for our life because we got this big gift some, from something or from somebody which is from outside. And I have to follow this. So, and it means if I am a, a member of a religion who believes in this type of religiosity, that uh, this is the only true way of life. And it means uh, this is a code for uh, extension. So I don't want to say that these type of religions would like to convert everybody because uh, uh, they believe they are superior and they would like to force them uh, in very bad or, or wrong or evil reasons or force them to be like them. No, it can be from a good heart. Because if I believe this is the only way of life, the only way uh, to reach the eternity, to go to the heaven, which is the biggest happiness, or absolutely forever, I would like to tell to the people, I would like to make a mission and invite them. Because if I give them this gift which I got, they will be happy in an eternal way, but they have to be like me. Because if they are not like me, they, they, they won't go to the heaven. So it is a separation. It, is, it, it started with the monotheism. And this type of forms of the churches nowadays, uh, who are telling this type of message to the people, maintain the borders, maintain the conflicts, from a theological and anthropological way, I guess. And it's not the best message, I guess, for the people who live under the postmodern uh, cultural uh, patterns or with the, this type of cultural patterns. But at the same time, it can be a good message for the people because, as you said, it's true. People, and, and, and Yuri said, people are uncertain. And sometimes they are fed up with this individualism. What I can do with the individualism? What I can do with myself? And after I got a message from my uh, original uh, church or another church, and I can convert, I can uh, be a member of them, I can follow the real truth, and this type of secularization, postmodern problems are solved in my life. But it cannot help in somehow a, the deal with the borders. It cannot help. It will maintain, again, the borders between this type of religions and between the religious people, traditional religious people, and the non-traditional religious people as well. This is why I thought it's complex, but this is how I see. It's not so peaceful, I know. It's quite critical, but this is how I see from the perspective of my experiences. Yeah, um, we, you gave a, comp, uh, a really very good the characterization of the phenomenology of the belief systems, and also it was very clever that you even uh, included the directness of the problem. Professor Scott, I would like to have your opinion concerning this kind of conflict between yeah. the desire and the uh, 
uh, you are probably the most uh, pessimistic chair that I had in my life. But I know that you were. <laughs> uh, uh, I, to see. My PhD was in uh, Arthur Schopenhauer. He's the most pessimistic philosopher. Uh, I like Thomas Berenhard, the most pessimistic uh, writer. But still, I understand that from this pessimism, which I also share somehow, uh, we must. So we are competing. Uh, yes, and. and uh, uh, trying to do in, of course, if we think about Trump, uh, Erdogan, Putin, and those uh, uh, similar personalities, they are, of course, symptoms of our uh, narcissistic age, which are inhabiting, and they somehow were really starting to come. Uh, probably they must be here, uh, as, as Neron and Caesar must have been in, in the Roman era. And what will come uh, in the future, we still do not know. But we have, of course, we have to fight in, in our own uh, in our own way. I would raise two questions. One is the question of education. The second one is my revived question of communities. Now, in a more uh, intersubjective manner. Uh, firstly, we know that uh, humanities since 2006. If we, we read an excellent book by Martha Nussbaum, uh, not for profit. In 2006, the uh, American Ministry of Sci uh, Education started a campaign against humanities. They wanted to approach uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and all those uh, you know, civilizations that somehow insist that it is good if your child is, uh, is excellent in science, if he does the math all, all the way on to the evening. In between, he takes some maybe piano lectures, but he must you know, be active for 12, 14, 16 hours. This is really bad. And as a consequence, of course, humanities were under attack, first in the United States, then it was this famous Middlesex philosophy department that was cancelled. Then, you know, like a wave, it came into Europe, and now, of course, humanities are under threat because they are uh, not, uh, not uh, good enough in, in, the, in, the, in of course, their cost-benefit structure, a way they are, they are consuming. Even my colleagues, which are working in, at humanities department in the U.S., they they are they have you know enough money. They are even in, in the positive numbers, but they are not earning enough money, so they are still cancelled. And the first humanities that are under attack are of course always uh, classics, Greek, Roman history, philosophy, uh, languages like French, Italian, and so forth. And then slowly, you know, theology and other. Um, uh, uh, anthropology education, so on. Now, uh, what to do? Without education, without uh, education, there is no imagination in children. Of course, if you teach them all, only science, mathematics, they will probably not uh, not develop. You need arts education, you need humanistic education, you need them to read uh, novels, you need, have they, have, they have some free time to play, to interact, and so on. This is now disappearing from all schools, and this is our first, probably, uh, fight that we must uh, uh, fight uh, against you know, extinction of humanities from or the spirit of humanities. They might pretend that they are humanities, but they are not, you know, because the spirit of humanities will be lost soon. So we must fight for, fight for this. The children will be able, and for example, Finland is going this way. After some experiments with education, that that were that, that they were doing some uh, psychological, you know, tests and. Uh, girls were in a way uh, depressed because of this uh, education and the boys were uh, narcissistic or cynical so they, they saw from the psychology evidence psychology based research evidence that this approach is not working and now they're going back and they will not start with kindergarten in the five or six years old but in seven years old and so forth these are small steps but extremely important steps and of course, if we do not have a, a proper interreligious education or interreligious dialogue education, if we do not teach about democracy, who will be able to vote? You know, for for uh, democratic parties. Of course, we get populism and so forth. So this is, of course, it is a very pessimistic scenario. But we must fight. Another one is uh, uh, this individualism or narcissistic society which we are living. I, I talked about communities, and I would say that what we need is relational ontology. So what we do have now is individualistic ontology all the way. For example, when you mention, I don't, don't want to attack you because I don't don't judge your you know interaction with yoga. For example, 
but there are so many, you know, spiritual, as you say in brackets, uh, practices. You will see people, you know, training in some, you know, spiritual exercise, but they will not be together. They will not be forming some kind of relational uh, ontology, but they will mostly be individualistic in 90-90%, I guess. They will be practicing some kind of uh, placebo uh, spirituality or placebo religion, which will, of course, feed their egos. They will feed them. They will know that they're doing something else that they were taught of. It is, of course, escape of conservative uh, education they were faced, or it is an upgrade of, of uh, anti-conservative or totally uh, post-communist or communist uh, education that they were also raised in. So what we need is a new new religion. Of course, churches, in my opinion, churches will not be able yet to, to go this way because they are still fighting. In each country, there is a fight against, you know, between churches and society, and there is abortus issue, and there is this, you know, all these issues that are, they're fighting instead of fighting about community, about uh, living together, about uh, relational ontologies, and so forth. So I like, uh, for example, French philosopher Lucy Rigaray. I have done a lot of research on her, also with her, in cooperation with her. She's probably leading, uh, one of the leading philosophers of our age, not only a woman philosopher, but of all, of course. She's talking in her words about between us, about sharing the world, about new culture of sentiments, about new culture of senses, about democracy which begins between two. So this is the only way that we have. Uh, you provided the third very important uh, uh, concept uh, for this uh, morning. Uh, first was the spirituality, second was community, and third is education. I completely agree with you. But I would like to add that if we continue with education the way we do, uh, it's absolutely fruitless and hopeless. I have uh, uh, young kids in my family, and I know very well that without digitalization of humanities, we can go around. Uh, without digitalization of the whole education process, without improving uh, uh, the world opened by the internet, and just based on the traditional needs of uh, authoritarian education, uh, there won't be any sort of democracy, any sort of spirituality, any sort of community. So we have to transform ourselves before uh, we educate our uh, kids. And now I turn to you. Uh, you had a very important remark, and uh, just I would like to, uh, to be continued. When you characterize the rigidity of institutions and the new sense of uh, religious uh, search in people, and uh, as we have heard in the case of Slovenia, there is a very, uh, very conservative Catholic Church, uh, probably not meeting, they are not meeting the needs uh, of, the, of the people. So, uh, what's your opinion about uh, about this kind of rigidity of institutions on, on the one hand? and the flexibility and liquidity and fluidity of the people uh, striving for meaning of life <coughs> provided by spirituality and uh, by the belief in God. Personally, I disagree uh, with uh, uh, Professor Poppy had. Well, no uh, surprise. Yeah, <laughs> well, surprise. I was in the <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just, uh, just a few thoughts before. Yeah, uh, so don't take yoga lessons before. No, 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 it's not about yoga. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if I understood uh, well what, from what you said, that you link very strongly um, religion and um, extreme nationalism, actually, and uh, totalitarian uh, thinking, and I would strongly disagree with this. Okay. Uh, with this, because I think that uh, if you if you see history, for example, history of Europe totalitarian systems came after the French Revolution and came after the Reformation and came after uh, the Middle Ages, so after Christendom. So I think that uh, this is, uh, comes uh, from a lack of religion, actually. Or you, or you, have, uh, or you have a god, or you, have, or, or you need another leader. That's, that's true, but I, I, I wouldn't confuse the two things. And, and, the, uh, and the other one is that um, if I understood well, um, it sounded like um, a quest or a, a demand of Christianity and Islam for universal truth. It's, it's a kind of violence. And I would say that uh, if we want to do something about um, peace, uh, religious peace, uh, 
I think that we have to, to make a very strong distinction that to be a missionary religion, religion is not uh, to be violent, I think. Because religion by itself, by its definition, want, wants to influence society. And, and for this, I think that it's naive to think about, to, to say that um, religion can be without any power, actually. Because religion wants to influence people. That's, that's true. And, and we, can, we can speak, of course, yeah. uh, in what way, or, um, but, uh, but the other very important thing is that, uh, at least uh, in Christianity, faith has to be a, a free answer of the person. So, so I think it's, it's important that to be, for, from my point of view, that to be a missionary, to be a missionary religion is not to be uh, violent. Uh, okay. So uh, I didn't mean yeah. that the Christianity and totalitarianism is together. I yeah, thought yeah, only yeah. the concept of this monotheistic point of view yes. could be uh, the origin of the secular religions as nationalism. I mean, the connection, it's not direct. Yeah, but I think it, it, it's a human Only the concept, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so rigidity, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mention I didn't talk about the rigidity of institution and, and uh, yeah, maybe it was, um, uh, it was my institution <laughs> has to be rigid uh, to be an institution. Not always. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, it can be a flexible rigidity. <laughs> or uh, yeah, and um, I think that uh, that maybe it's uh, it's uh, very hard to speak about what to be, what uh, what does it mean to be a conservative church? I don't know anything about the Slovenian church. And uh, I know that, uh, for example, compared to, to the Netherlands or to Belgium, the Hungarian church is deemed to be very conservative, but I mean, it's, it's, I think it's very subjective uh, from many points of view. So um, uh, what I, I see a, a, very, a really big challenge for, for, the, for the church, uh, how, how do we respond as, as, um, as believers to this new quest for for spirituality, which is inside the Yeah, this was my question. Yeah, and what's your, what's your answer? Yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's a very good challenge for us, because, uh, or for believers, because uh, we have to, to create uh, new ways uh, to, to get people in touch with, with God or with the transcendence. And, and this, I think it's a, it's a very positive uh, challenge for the believer um, that uh, that we have to, to reflect on our own faith or our, our own spirituality, I would say, and to create new ways because uh, I would say that uh, the old ways are, are functioning too. For example, it's a very interesting phenomenon in, in uh, Christianity, uh, the revival of pilgrimages, which is a very ancient and very, how do you say, um, popular devotional thing and it's, it's not Yeah, like, it was the tourism of the medieval times. Yeah, yeah, but it's a religious tourism, yeah. <laughs> and, and you can see a, a, a big revival and among, for example, the Camino, it's a um, kind of secularized uh, pilgrimage. So it's an interesting thing that there is this, uh, this phenomenon that you have the, the old ways of, of uh, spiritual quests. Yes, it's a very good example, by the way. Uh, which are, yeah. For example, but not all, only Camino, there is the, here in, in Pesek, there is the... Here we have the road. Maria Ruth and, and the Camino and the, 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 so it, it's really, uh, really popular and, and, uh, and you can see that there is a, there is a need to express uh, religion uh, through the body. And yoga, for example, is <laughs> for this, <laughs> I think it's the wrong way for that, <laughs> the, but... Uh, but you can see that uh, after a, a very extreme rationality of the Enlightenment, which uh, emphasized or emphasized a very uh, strong distinction between uh, mind and the body, now there are new ways which uh, try to connect mind and uh, mind and the body. And for example, human which is a is a new way. So I think that uh, it's a challenging situation for the church. Okay. Now I turn to the most critical question, and this was my aim. Now I thought about organizing this panel, but this, this, this was just the introduction. That how do you see the role of religion, especially the Christian religion, in the formation of the so-called European identity? Because certainly this need for identity is, 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 can be felt uh, by anyone who is living in this territory, identified as yours. But we don't know what the hell does it mean to be European. We don't know the meaning behind uh, this category of European. 
And my question is that, do you have any contribution from the perspective of religion to the content of the answer concerning the question, who are you, in terms of being European? Or being European and being Christian and being Muslim and being Jewish, these are separate questions. I think this is the most crucial problem which we are faced now. Maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, who is going to respond or respond to this uh, first, perhaps you? Because you are moving around in all Well, <coughs> we had in uh, 2013 the anniversary of the 1,700 years of the Edict of Milan. You mentioned Neron and Caesar after a time of 300 years of persecution of Christianity. There was the Edict of Tolerance which was uh, uh, released by the emperor and from that moment on uh, people should be free to choose their faith and uh, to live their faith and respect other faiths which are among. People were invited to pray for the emperor or for the government and so on. 1700 years later in all countries in Europe the religious communities, all interreligious in, uh, um, initiatives and so on, were discussing how to celebrate this anniversary. And you know what? That all those uh, established religions, religious communities, were sitting together with politicians and also with ambassadors of other countries. I was personally present to see how Really, everybody was uh, talking about to find a soul for Europe, a soul for the world, spirituality. Did they find? Well, we were, we were talking about the need of education as you talk. And, and in the last years, you see that there are more and more uh, um, institutions which are called cultural, Christian cultural centers or interreligious cultural centers. People need, uh, in order to uh, express this uh, identity of, uh, of future continent while seeing how each other are having a, a social doctrine. That means how we regulate our uh, relationships from religions to the society, from religions to the state, from religions to re religions and so on. How we uh, sh uh, cope with the problems of the world, for example, sanctions. When you have from uh, um, states sanctions, mostly the sanctions are not affecting or influencing those who are, have caused the political disease, but mostly uh, affecting the, the population. And there, I think, uh, on one side, it's true that uh, where is economically growth in the world, we seem to feel that there is a, a going down of a religious identity. But I think that we are uh, living in times where we see a different phenomenon, uh, that there are coming more and more declarations about how to express the interreligious vision of the world. And um, the thing is how all these declarations which are made by politicians, by, by uh, diplomats, by church leaders, by uh, religious leaders, how they are getting accepted by the people, by the population. And there, I think, will be a start to see that some, somewhere it is totally legitimate that we shall be pessimistic because there is there are differences between cultures and religious, but this, the difficult things are the really important ones. So seeing between us, we should not stop there. We only, what we can do is to correct caricatures. This is important. And go, being on our way to finding a future identity of Europe is in order to see that some things that we are uh, different but we have learned to respect each other. And what I said in the beginning, we have a sense <coughs> of mutual responsibility and accountability. Not everybody can do what he wants, but he has to, uh, to recognize, as we say, the rules of the games and to help that uh, uh, um, caricatures are not interfering in our search for uh, 
pluralism for inter, uh, uh, cultural and interreligious dialogue. So the European identity does include or exclude uh, issues of uh, religious identity? Includes, of includes. course, includes, of course. And uh, what we say that churches are not able very often to see the new challenges of the This is right, and, and we know that, but we cannot say that in general because there are things where the churches are aware that many modern phenomena are not yet really explored. We do not really know yet how to uh, encounter with so, such phenomena. And then you stay conservative, what is normal, but we know the problems and we accept them as difficult, but we see it as they are difficult, they are necessary. Vicky? Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I know the question is complex. Uh, yeah, 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 you already know it. Um, um, nowadays, we are planning to make a research with my Spanish and uh, Dutch colleagues about the uh, connections uh, between uh, Euroscepticism and the new spirituality. And it's a very interesting question, I guess, and it is about the European identity. So, what we observed with my anthropologist uh, uh, colleagues from Spain and, and the Netherlands, that somehow uh, practicing any forms of not only yoga, any any forms of uh, spirituality connects somehow to a non-European, some European critical point of view. For example, in Spain now it's very very popular uh, candomblé from Brazil and. Uh, different forms of Native American practices from Hopis, from uh, Peruvian tribes, from Amazonian tribes, uh, magic and, and traditional healing and uh, ayahuasca, maybe you heard about that, I'm sure you heard about this. Um, so these type of forms uh, uh, had a revival, a new forms in Spain. But of course, at the same time with the Oriental, Eastern, Asian, traditional uh, practic practicing. So if you see, they are completely different, some recolonialist uh, uh, practices, absolutely different than the European traditional religiosity or spirituality. So this is a question. And we also can count for the ancient pagan uh, rituals and practicing. For example, in Hungary you can find Tartos uh, movements, which means the old shamans, uh, or in the Netherlands even, or in, 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 in Spain the old uh, Celtic uh, uh, religious ways of life. So this is also pre-Christian, old Asian, pagan, European things, which are absolutely opposite of the recent or formally, officially, traditional European, European uh, traditions. And, but we have to emphasize, I guess, that they are this type of uh, anti or counter-European uh, uh, critical uh, 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 practicing spiritualism. It's not only a critique. It's not only a critical way which is against, the, for example, the Christian uh, European tradition, it is against the rationalism as well, which is also a part, also a very important part of the Europeanness, the new rational scientific objective thinking. So they are answers for this new situation, this postmodern liquidity, new forms of life. We somehow are against not only with the traditional uh, religious uh, uh, forms of the Europeanness, no, they are against the rational, also very Europeanish uh, uh, way of thinking. So, and I guess the big question uh, which connects to this type of problem is the question of Islam. Because the people who are practicing spirituality in a different form as uh, the, the, the Christian forms, traditional Christian forms of spirituality, they somehow, as we see, but the answers will come from this future research, but as we see now with my colleagues, that uh, the people who are practicing spirituality uh, uh, thinks that 
this type of non-European forms of life are the authentic way of thinking and life. So, for example, the Vedical thinking or the Buddhist thinking or the uh, neo-pagan thinking is the authentic, th uh, authentic thinking and they are the authentic values because they are against the traditional European values and identities. But, but about the Islam, Islam is non-authentic from this perspective uh, or it is an authentic way from this perspective because it's non-European. It's somehow exotic. It is from the East. It is also an Asian, a different, and in this way, authentic, non-European form of spirituality. But at the same time, when we are uh, experiencing Islamophobia and we are uh, thinking about the theological way, which uh, shows that Islam is much closer to Christianity than to these new forms of spirituality. So the big question in the future, how the people will react for this new Islam revival and appearance in Europe? It, people will convert to Islam because Islam has new answers if we compare with the traditional European answers, rationalism and Catholicism, or Islamophobia will create a new form again of the European-ness, which will say we can be non-Europeans, critical Europeans, we are critical against or with the traditional Christian and rational heritage, but there are borders. If we see the Islam and the refugees and other problems, we can close and we can separate ourselves from the Muslims and it in the name of the Europeanness, which will give a platform between the new spirituality and the traditional European Very good. You took uh, over my role. Point of view. Uh, we will see. Questions. Well, I just uh, say this question because I will face uh, as you. But before, uh, uh, Professor Scott, uh, how do you see this um, problem of European identity, religious identity? Is there any clash or, or is there any hope uh, for reconciliation? Uh, under the umbrella of yeah. being European. Okay, I will just, uh, just very briefly, yeah. a few seconds, just to respond to what I think by conservatism I agree and with both of you. I'm talking about certain surplus of conservatism, of course. Oh, yeah, church is, yeah. Yes, uh, churches are important and the idea of the church is probably one of the greatest ideas of the humankind, of course, uh, after the, this Roman Empire, slavery and so forth, so we all know that. I'm talking about certain surplus that I do not like that comes from certain fear that is oriented towards things that shouldn't be, you know, they fight with usually with people who, with things that are not worth fighting instead of imagining new things for the humanity. You know. for, for example, I've been teaching for more than 20 years and at the Faculty of Theology, which is Catholic, and it works under uh, both laws, Vatican and under civic law. So we are both University of Ljubljana and both under Vatican. So this is a problematic situation. So, and they are inclined to go into this way more than into a more civic, secular way. And I see that students among them are always one third are priest candidates, all male of course, because women are not capable of being priests, as we know in the Catholic Church, which is said. So they become more and more disinterested in questions. For example, I teach interreligious dialogue, Buddhism, Hinduism, religions of India, which I have specialized also. So they're not really not interested in this anymore. They, I even got question last year, why is comparison necessary, you know, in religions and so forth. And that's, this would not come out 20 years ago, but maybe it's still, again, so it's it's subjective. Kind of closeness. Yeah, and it's a fear, basically, fear, and they're fighting wars which are really not important now, you know. Uh, with people who are in, I don't know, New Age, with people who are lost, you don't fight these wars. You should, you know, go into serious, you know, theology, into serious uh, intercultural theology, which is very modern important uh, style of thinking, but mainly in Protestant countries and so forth. About your question, what will be the future of European, uh, 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 European Union, maybe? I think, ideally, it should be post-Christian, post-Islamic, post-New Age, post-Enlightenment. Um, this means that what I most like in, in Islam, for example, 
are, uh, I don't know, Iranian theologians, philosophers, works in the U.S., like Hamid Dabashi, Ali Nusepasi, they, you know, they know Derrida, they know Foucault, they know Western philosophy, but they're also, you know, Muslims. And they, of course, they should, are not allowed to go to Iran now, <laughs> currently. This is a problem. Yeah, this is a problem. I've been visiting Iran for the last two years, and I like this country. A book will be published there, my book about uh, philosophy. It is a beautiful country, but you know they will need a couple of years to, to probably to solve their problems. A couple of decades, perhaps. Maybe I don't know. You know, I talked to Shirin Ebadi. She was a, a guest in Slovenia, and she thinks a couple of years because of this economic situation, they will be forced to change things. But what I think about post-Christianity, it is Christian, but this is something more. You know, not something less. Post-Islamic, it is Islamic, but it's something more than than what we think. Uh, by Islamic. Of course, it will be neo-paganism included. Uh, it will be uh, maybe not New Age, but all these movements, uh, it will be post-enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment is extremely important, but you so know... it's going to be a bazaar? No, it will probably be something that, uh, for example, Charles Taylor, he said that the state should not be Christian, should not be Islamic, should not be nor, nor Marxist, and should not be Kantian state. So. The state should not be an ideology and should be a community. And churches, as they are per se, in their dogmatic way of thinking, of course cannot form identity for, for the state. But they can form a very important reservoir, one of the more many, many reservoirs like you know, Berger and Lupin would call mm -hmm. uh, intermediate institutions from which we all should should you know drink, you know, this and one of these, you know, things is are more representative. Some of them are less, but this is all what we have. You know, we live in, in a pluralistic society. This is for sure, and it is this rhizomatic structure. It is not anymore that somewhere deep down there is a spiritual person who will teach us and so forth. But anyone can teach us. You know, a, a brave uh, uh, artist can teach us, or a doctor can teach us. For example, I just read this book yesterday by a. Uh, is head of medical services at Lampedusa. You know, it is a book on, on uh, it's an extremely important book, but I have only Slovenian translation. You know, from uh, Pietro Bartolo. You know, Italian title is Lacrime di Sale. It is the book you know that should teach us, and this is a post-Christian book because he is a Christian guy, but he knows that you know he's helping uh, Muslims, he's helping atheists. Whenever it comes, he's helping. And this is all that, that we have. You know, we're getting more American. Why do you think so? Well, it's a very sympathetic all embracing. You know, Americans still, yeah. and there is one interpretation. The plus, the in, in Europe, you had, you know, in Europe, you have, ex, you had uh, this wars between you know religions. You had communist regimes. You had fascism, Nazism. United States were somehow still until now well, we don't know until what now <laughs> yeah. they were preserved because of their you know structure of, of religious uh, yeah. life so this still is a there are some positive things to be searched for in the you know, united states despite their political leader uh, current uh, how do you see the challenge of uh, the muslim problem in the european context um is there any chance to evolve a post-muslim uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've researched a lot of it because I asked myself some identity questions. Yeah, um, response. Yeah, my, <laughs> my response is, when we look at Europe um, um, 100, 100 years ago, it was always as the same culture cycle. Um, it has not been a, a Muslim population in Europe. It depends uh, where, uh, uh, how you define Europe, but it was pretty the same cultural cycle. And how and suddenly uh, in the new modern world um, you see you see exotic religion with headscarves and <coughs> people who are taking their religious seriously or a little bit more seriously than others or than, than we Europeans uh, do and when I look at, at, at statistics, I think it will change drastically. I think um, the Muslim population will become uh, as a, a bigger part of, uh, of Europe. Um, and it will happen a, a post-Islamic uh, post uh, period, definitely. Because problems uh, which are today uh, represented are based on, on other issues than religions. Uh, for example, social economic um, 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 roots, um, low 
development in, 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 um, in education. So Muslim pe the Muslim population in Europe is, is one of the weakest in terms of, of, of statistics when you look at it. Um, this will change, I think, and it depends how we, how we get along with. Um, when I look at, at, at how we are talking about the Muslim population in, 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 in uh, Europe, it's, it's, uh, it seems that it's more confrontation, confrontational. And it seems that um, every leader, for example, our chancellor too, uh, is using it for for um, for political or for power purposes. I understand it how he, uh, why he uh, why he do, uh, why he does it, but um, it it will nothing uh, it will nothing it it will lead, it will not lead to to uh, something good. Yeah, but it does work. Yeah, definitely it does work in Hungary too, or not? Really? Yeah, when he, I, I, I read the speech from, from, from the Prime Minister uh, as he was uh, inaugurated um, about the Christian democracy in, 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 in Hungary. He's not uh, saying um, um, a pluralistic where, where, you can parti where every religion can participate in a Christian democracy. Um, he means Christian democracy is the only democracy. Yeah, and no, I, I agree, I agree. He's not alone in Europe. He's not. A, yeah, he's not. A, yeah, you're true. Yeah, you're right. But um, um, the the question is how we will confront with reality. 1925, we had two billion people. Hundred years later, we are eight. This uh, this number has quadrupled uh, in the past hundred years. Yeah, and the, heard it last week. Uh, yeah, but but the the, the, the society, the, the world has become a, a village. So Egypt, when when Egypt collapses. For, 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 for some reasons, there will a huge amount of refugees coming to us. What will we do? Shoot at them? Or, or, or let them uh, die in the water? Fortunately, this problem will be discussed tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> so, and, yeah, but how we will come together and talk about maybe a world ethos, a world ethical um, um, uh, base of rules, where every religion can agree with. This, this, is, this is going to be the final question, this uh, moral universalism. Yeah. But before going to that question, uh, I would like to have your opinion on uh, how Christianity and the European identity uh, are in harmony or in conflict, or, or European identity will be a sort of post-Christian, uh, uh, post post-Muslim, post-Jewish uh, uh, construction. Okay, I'm not a professor, I don't know what. <laughs> Well, it should be, but uh, I think that the, if, if I see historically, Europe uh, is defined by Christianity, actually, and then the, by the Enlightenment. And I cannot imagine Europe without the, the, the Christian, Christian roots. But the question is how uh, Christianity can promote it. And I think that in this situation, uh, several of you talked about this uh, crisis of rationality. Uh, in postmodern, and I think that uh, Christianity has a, has a role to play in this, uh, to promote a new, uh, I would call it a new rationality, uh, um, a kind of discourse which is based on, on rationality. Christianity was linked to love, but I think that Christianity is linked to, to, the, to the intellect, uh, to rationality as well, or, or to both. And, uh, and at the beginning, at first, uh, Christianity it was linked um, very closely with Greek philosophy, and this link is still there. Uh, Christianity has a very uh, strong intellectual tradition. Uh, based on that, I think that uh, uh, Christians should promote a rational discourse, a dialogue in Europe, based on based on on. Uh, what, what is called the natural law, for example, which, is a, which could be a common denominator for, uh, for religious people and for non-religious people also. Uh, my my do doctor, it wasn't Thomas Aquinas, was a very optimistic thinker. <laughs> Maybe I am too naive about this, but uh, I think that that, that could be a, a way. But I, I am not very optimistic about this because I'm teaching theology also, and I see that this um, Many times there is a lack of, of uh, intellectual curiosity in students, what I see, that there are no questions for people. I mean, they just, 
accept or do not accept, I don't know, but, but, uh, but they do want questions and I, I, I see quite quite dangerous. So I think that for the church or for the for Christianity, uh, a big role would be to promote uh, this new kind of professional uh,